Great. Greg Sharp, thank you for joining us today. How are you doing? My pleasure. I'm doing great. How's yeah. everything there? It's good. It's good. Where are you calling from? I'm calling from Irvine, California. Irvine. Uh, no, I grew up in Astoria, Oregon. I still consider that home. Irvine's where I've done all my real estate. Nice, nice. I've, uh, I've gone down to Santa Rosa and L.A., but I've never made it to Irvine. I've heard good things, though. Yeah, it's a great area. Yep. Great, great area. All right, to get us started, why don't you just let, um, let everybody know, you know who you are, where you're from, and how did you get started in real estate? <laughs> Um, I was an engineer that got frustrated with working for too many over-promoted engineers. And so one day I decided to get my real estate license. And then one day I decided to quit. Um, asked my wife if I could quit. I said, I think I can do this real estate thing full time. She said, okay, meaning, okay, we can talk about it. I hung up with her and called my boss and quit. <laughs> one foot out the door. It really, that's like burning your ships on the shore. I had no no job to fall back on, and I stumbled into condo conversions fairly quickly, and I did condo conversions from 2003 until the crash, which took me down completely, but I, I did probably about $100 million in transactions over the 10-year uh, time frame. Oh, wow. And so I learned a lot, uh, both good and bad. And I'm in the process of kind of rebuilding again because my wife said to go back and real, uh, get a real job about five years ago. So I did, but it's never going to pay for my retirement. So real estate's there and I, I have to be in it to make sure that I can retire because I live in California and real estate's expensive. Oh yeah. I can, my girlfriend's from Santa Rosa and I, uh, I whenever we go down and visit her family, I just kind of on Zillow, just checking things out. $700,000 for a two bed, one bath. Just, just ridiculous. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, it's all about the cash flow, which we don't have in California. Great appreciation, but no cash flow. Yep. And I was talking to a friend today. He's buying properties around Bakersfield and he's getting like a 20, 25% cash on cash return annually. Bakersfield, Ohio. California. California. Okay. Yeah. Wow. So there are outlying areas where you can find basically crappy properties. They're the bread and butter tenants and you can get cash flow in California, but still in those areas, you don't get the appreciation like in Orange County. Gotcha. Okay. So there are different aspects of the real estate with the condo conversions. That was all about uh, value add yep. by, you know, we do the acquisition analysis as an apartment building, uh, have to manage it like an apartment building, do all the entitlements, do all the renovation, and then market and sell. So it's like house flipping, but on steroids. Yeah, because you and have so many. Yeah, now the problem was when the market went down, I had 75 condos to sell in about five projects. Oof. And with condo conversions, you can only sell so many per week. You've got a, a sales rate pace, a sales rate you can keep up, that you have to keep up with. So a couple of, pro, couple of units per week, is about the best you can do. So we'd drop prices, sell, drop prices, sell, and leverage on the way down is just as ugly as it is beautiful on the way up. <laughs> and so that, that ended up taking me out completely, took all my capital with me, with yeah. it. Um, so with no capital and everybody holding on to their money, not letting anybody else invest for them, you have a very hard time coming back from that sort of thing at that time. So awesome. Then we're catching you on the, the upswing. That's uh, that's perfect. Yeah. I, I'm back mostly in services right now, okay. but I will be connecting with people and trying to do some uh, capital raising once I find some decent projects that I'd like to pursue. Awesome. Okay. So in 2008, you or before 2008, you were doing condo conversions. Um, I'm, I'm assuming you buy basically flip condos. Um, then 2008 hit, you hit a rough patch. You're back into it. So now, what's your uh, what's your main bread and butter? What type of real estate are you in right now? Uh, I after 2008 for a number of years, I brokered hard money. So okay. I'm back to brokering hard money. Uh, managed to find the lenders that are still lending. Most of it's hard money. There are some others that are pretty good loans. I've got some phenomenal FHA product. You know, 35, 40 year loans below three percent, which non recourse. Uh, and it's all based on the value of the property. It's like, 
dang, I wish I had some big apartment building because I would refi right now. Yeah. But uh, uh, mostly I'll be finding hard money loans. Uh, I'm going to be brokering two to four unit listings. Uh, they've got a program called Property Radar. Oh, yeah. Which I'm, you're familiar with that? Yep, I've used it. It's one of the better programs. Um, I was actually at a trade show in the booth next to the founder of Property Radar hawking my stuff uh, years ago. <laughs> nice. Uh, he, he did a little better than I did, but uh, it's, it's all about the, the listings and then looking for the value add. If every good deal that you find will get funded. Okay. So yep. I just have to find the right good deals and I've got a large enough network still that I can bring in some people that have money that'll back me and we'll partner on things again. All right. Very nice. So you're, so you're um, hard money brokering. And you're actively searching for fix and flips. Um, is it just uh, condos or are you doing single family, multifamily? I'm targeting three and four unit properties. Okay. Multifamily. We'll call it two to four. Well, multifamily-ish. <laughs> yeah. It, the single family version of the multifamily. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, and mainly because when I lost everything, I also lost my house. So part of my rebuilding strategy is to buy a fourplex and live in it because yep. I'll have enough years left before retirement that I can build a revenue stream that my housing costs in California will be covered when I want to retire. Yep. yep and yep, that's, yep. you know, that's the baseline stability factor that I'm, I'm going after. Gotcha. And yep. that's one of the things that I didn't realize going into it. I, um, I had never been through a down cycle. Yeah. And once you go through it, it really changes your mind, uh, your mindset. So there are a lot of uh, first-time investors out there now that have never seen a down cycle. Yep. And even this right now, it's, it's not really a, a downturn. I mean, that was the worst one since the 30s, right? Yeah. Yeah, they say one is, uh, one is coming up. But the last 10 years have been fantastic, that is for sure, especially for flippers. Yeah. And uh, it's, it's fun. I enjoy it immensely. Uh, there's nothing more fun than making something beautiful and making money at it. Absolutely. Uh -huh. I'm, I'm right there with you. So, uh, okay. So you're looking right now, you're, you're doing hard money loans. You're looking for, um, you're looking for properties. So when it comes to the, the fix and flip, um, rental aspect of your business, how do you go about attracting leads? How do you, how do you go about finding the properties that you're actually looking to invest in? What I'm doing right now, it's mostly property radar. Okay. There is a, a book called the, um, uh, Larry Kurtz has a book called The Direct, uh, Apartment Directories. And so that's one where he's manually collected data. So I can use that as well. Um, there's also a family office network group that I belong to. And there you, you see the mandates of the people with money. So I can call up people from the uh, property radar. I've got all the title listings. So I've been doing some mailings as well. Okay just started that. And then there's the apartment directories. It's um, like a $1,300 a year rental fee for the list. And, uh, but it's very accurate. Oh, that's and that cool. covers all three plus units in Orange County. Oh, and nice. it's pretty accurate. So between property radar, the apartment directories and the MLS and title records, I should be able to have a good way of cross referencing and finding enough people to uh, bring in the bit find the opportunities and what I can't list, I'll try to flip or bring in capital. And so I, I can actually come in with people and say that they want to reposition their portfolio. I, I have the resources to do it. That's great. So the difference between me and someone that's purely flipping a flipper is just trying to get their margin. Well, I can go in and I don't have to have my margin, but I can take a real estate commission. I yeah, can refinance and take a commission. Yep. So uh, my competitors are the flippers and I have strategies that I've just said that how I'm going to beat out the flippers is that I don't have to make a, a, as big a margin as they might want to. That makes sense. Yeah. I've, uh, um, I mean, I've done flips in the past. It's not something that I'm, that I would ever consider myself to be. That's not, that's not where I focus my energy at all. Um, it's pretty difficult, but, uh, when I was doing that, when I was looking for opportunities to flip houses, um, it was, I was always getting beat out by people and I was wondering why. And it is because a lot of them are brokers and they can get the, the back end of actually listing the property um, themselves. And that, that makes a lot of sense. Um, and, and 
today the flippers, they're their own worst enemies because they are bidding up prices so high in California. I've got wholesalers that are coming to me and say, I got a great deal. It's 85% of ARV. It's like, but what about the repairs though? <laughs> there's that doesn't, I'll look at max 80% ARV if it includes repairs yeah. by my estimation, not yours. Yeah. And the, they say, Oh, well, I can sell it to somebody else. And it's like, well then do it. Let them struggle with it. I'm not yeah. going to, I'm, you know, having been through this once already in a big way, I I'm going to make sure that my time is well spent yep. and young investors, first time investors getting a deal is important. Yep. And so they're willing to take the, the thin deals. Yep. 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 And uh, I mean, the, it's pretty well known now the metric to use when flipping is actually 70% minus repairs. But although in California, your, uh, your property value is so high um, that probably wouldn't hold true down there, but but still 85%. Uh, it's pretty th thin. 80% including repairs. Um, that's not exactly a lot. Mm -hmm. And for me, it's like, I'm, I'm buying a real estate commission. Yep, yep, there are yep. contractors out there. They're buying the, the money to pay their crews so they don't have to lay them off. Right. So those are, again, people that are competing with the house flippers yep, yep, and yep. the wholesalers. All right. So, um, so we've talked a little bit about that. I want to uh, switch, switch gears just a little bit here um, and talk a little bit about your experiences and your stories. Um, I mean, you already touched on it a little bit. You went, you, you hit the 2008 market um, and, and you went through that and now you're on your way back up. Um, so we all know, you know, real estate has, it's, it's cyclical both in the nature of the economics of it and in your own emotional experience, highs and lows. Um, so can you kind of tell people, um, tell people, you know, what's the hardest thing that you've gone through and the lessons you learned in that? And then also, um, what's, what's the thing that you love the most about real estate? What's, what's the peak experience? What's, well, you know, what gets you out of bed for it? Well, the hardest thing ever was when I was doing the condo conversions. It was my first time through, and I had to make sure I knew everything. So I was spending a lot of time. It was a lot of work. Wasn't bringing in the money yet on the very first project. And if I had an easy way out, I think I would have taken it. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but today, if I... I have an easy out, so I don't have to do anything, and I have to stop myself and say, no, I have to push forward. I'm going to do it. So before it was the discipline to get through the anguish of being a first-time investor. Now it's the anguish of being super highly disciplined to keep pushing forward, knowing that eventually it's going to happen yep. because it will happen. It just takes time and patience. Absolutely. Um, and then uh, fighting through the uh, – the downturn, um, I had just uh, had a, an investment partner take a couple hundred thousand dollars from us. I had syndicated the funds, and I, on behalf of all the other people, I had to sue. Otherwise, they were all going to sue me. Yeah. And after I spent $50,000 that I didn't have with my attorney, he's the one that sat me down and said, Greg, uh, you know, you're going to have to declare bankruptcy. I said, but, but I owe you $50,000. He says, I'm a partner in the firm. Don't worry about it. I'll take care of it. Wow. So that was a double lesson. Number one, you know, you have to watch how you're spending your money and you got to do what's necessary, but don't, you know, make sure you can cover yourself, but always work with truly honorable people that are out for your best interest because when things go bad, they'll take care of you. Yep. I had a, a condo project that went bad and my investment partner uh, going into the meeting with him when he was going to invest, I had a, a syndicate group say, we've got all the money. And I said, well, I'm going in to accept it with the, the high net worth guy. And he said, Greg, the reason you want to work with me is that if and when things go bad, I can step in and cure things. Sure enough, the market tanked. The I'd never heard of lender fatigue. The bank said they weren't going to renew my loan. I called him up, Alec, you know, what are we going to do? Eh, don't worry about it. I'll write the check, pay off the bank, and I'll be the bank for you. Ah, that's why you told me that at the very beginning. Huh. So there are a lot of these things that I learned but didn't realize until years later. Gotcha. So always have somebody that you trust in your corner. <clears throat> and those people are the ones that make it all worthwhile. Um, and I have the personality that I'm great at starting projects and finishing them, but I'm not so great at operating them. So long-term projects like holding a massive apartment portfolio, 
I'll blow my brains out first. <laughs> but the turning properties, flipping, condo conversions, that sort of thing, this is the thing that, that really juices me because it's exciting, it's new, it's fresh, everything's a challenge, and it's complicated and detailed. So by education, I'm an engineer, and you'll see a lot of engineers in real estate. Yeah, and a lot guys, of that's uh, because you guys know your numbers, that's for sure. It's, it's complicated, they don't mind the difficult things, and uh, they get stimulated by it, but it's also a methodical process. That makes absolute sense. Um, so that, that was kind of the lesson that you learned. So what's your, you know, your peak? What's, what's the thing that you really enjoy? Um, the thing that, uh, that br brings you back to real estate? Uh, really, it's, it's the deal. It's, yeah. it's the deal. Uh, I love the deals. Um, I don't want to sound like I'm trying to imitate Trump and the art of the deal, but structuring things and putting it together and executing. Um, it, it's that, that sort of thing. But I've got some great friends. Uh, and good memories and people that will stand by me and it, it's the friendships you build so it, it really is a lifestyle that high net worth guy that I worked with um, he must be pushing 80 right now I haven't talked to him in a few years he ended up getting married and uh, you know he uh, couldn't stop doing real estate because that's where all of his friends were that makes sense and uh, you know so you make money with people and I want to do a deal when I turn a hundred. <laughs> so, and actually I, I'm 57 now. And oh, so at this point I'm more focused on getting younger people in my life so that when I'm 95 and a hundred trying to do a deal or two, I've got a lot of energetic 70 and 80 year olds around me. <laughs> Those 70 and 80 year olds, they've got the energy. That's for sure. Uh, yeah. And they've got the experience. They've been through cycles. Mm -hmm. And uh, in you know another 40 years, I'll have been through a couple more cycles, and by then I will have kept a lot of money too. <laughs> and uh, it'll you know it just makes it it's fun. The highlight of my entire career was on the first condo conversion project I did. It was like one year and one day after I got the investment check, I returned double his money, and I wrote a million dollar check. Wow, that had to have been. Quite the experience. <laughs> yeah, I wanted to keep it, but it was still pretty fun on his his part that I got to write the check that doubled his money in a year. That's pretty cool. And that, so how, you know, many, that's, how many condo conversions did you do during your during your stint? I did about thirteen projects, uh, totaling about two hundred and fifty units. Oh wow! Of which seventy five were not um, sold. Okay. Okay. Um, then along the way, I did a few notes, did some flips, uh, did some ground up luxury homes, did some property management, managed an HOA. Um, with all those HOAs or condo conversions, I had to create the HOA for each one. So I'm kind of an HOA expert uh, at this point. So uh, managing an HOA, I, I took on the angry old white guy that was uh, bullying all the diminutive first generation Asians. Oh, man. And, uh, and it's as every bit as ugly as it sounds. We've got 17 great people and one angry bully. <laughs> and uh, my yeah, partner HOAs was Asian. Can be, can be cut from, that's for sure. <laughs> yeah, um, my partner was Asian, so he got us in there. But they liked it because I was the white guy that stood up to this other really big white guy. <laughs> and uh, it, it, was, it was ugly. We were in court one time, and they said he never faced a judge. He just faced me fists clenched and breathing heavy on I specifically stood between him and the president of the HOA so that if he attacked he would attack me man that is a story <laughs> oh I, there are lots of stories like this um the time my crew went in to clean out a property and they all went home with fleas oh man <laughs> um, I, I had to apologize and, and buy them a few meals to make up for that <laughs> Well, that, yeah, that is definitely a, that's definitely something that Flipper is going to associate with going into a property and just being like, I don't want to touch anything here. This is this is disgusting. Um, so we're going to switch gears just one last time here. Um, I want to learn a little bit about you know what makes you tick, what what brings you uh, you know forward here. Um, so if you can kind of sum it up, like what habit um, contributes the most to your success in real estate investing? My superpower. <laughs> is analysis. So with the analysis, I can find the deals, make sure they're a good deal. And I'm analytical. Okay. And all right. It's 
when I say something, I know that I know it and I can prove that I know it. Gotcha. I've dealt with so many young investors, first timers, especially when the market was running up. You see all these investments out there. They're crap. They're literal crap. And I could point out the holes and boy, people would get upset. I said, look, it's crap. And here's why. And I don't care if you get upset about it. It's not a good deal. Yeah. You need to find better deals. Yep. Just like the wholesalers that bring me an 85% ARV deal. It's like, no, I'm not interested. Go find it, sell it to some other sucker. Yep. Okay. Analysis. I like that. And that is super important. It's uh, something that I'm working on myself. So, so that is that you got to have somebody with uh, good analytical skills on the team. And I'm book smart. So if you partner me with a street smart person, we're a very powerful team. I like and, that. And uh, so the analysis allows you to find the deal, make sure it's a good deal. And then you can find the partners Yep. When, and tying it up, always having liquid cash to tie up deals. Um, when you, when you control the deal, then people don't have just have to wait you out to take it from you. Right. Yep. Now, now you've got something of value to the value to them. So, so on top of that, um, so, you know, back, you know, you started to, uh, before 2008, um, if you can go back to that, that version of Greg back in 2000, whatever it was, whatever year, you know, you did your first comma conversion and you can give him one piece of advice. What would that piece of advice be? Don't get greedy. <laughs> the cycle ends. All right. I like it. Shortened to the point and uh, couched in plenty of experience, I'm sure. Yeah. Uh, have you ever heard of Bruce Norris? I have not, no. Bruce Norris is like a regional guru here in Southern California. He's a data guy. He mines all sorts of data. He's gotten really good. He predicted the downturn. He's testified in front of Congress and a great person to get to know from an investment standpoint. Uh, but he was uh, someone that's very big on analysis as well. And I kind of modeled some things after him. When he predicted the downturn, he was three or four years early before the crash in 2007-8. And he says, I don't know why it's, it's not crashing now. Yeah. But when it happened, he was safe. And he says, yeah, I missed out on a couple years of really great returns, but I kept my capital. Yep. But I didn't lose it all either. So that's good. Didn't. <laughs> that's, uh, yeah. Watching out for the downturns is definitely something that every investor is, is wary of. Um, okay, so for people who would like to get in, in contact with you, um, first, what is it that, that you want? What is it you want people to bring you? And then uh, how can people get in contact with you? I'm going to ask you a question first. Uh, most of your people that are being watching this, they're up in the Seattle Pacific Northwest area? Nope, this is, uh, this is a national. It's, it's going to be on okay. YouTube. It's going to be, it hasn't la launched yet, but it'll be on YouTube, on podcasts, wherever, um, anywhere in the U.S., essentially. Yeah, basically for anybody nationwide, it's uh, bring me multifamily loans. Uh, wow. I have a network of 750 banks that will soon start lending. Plus, I've got great apartment loans. and I've got hard money lenders scattered across the country. So basically for finance, I can help you uh, get the financing done. Okay. Um, if you've got a great opportunity, I do have people that will go nationwide that might be equity partners, but I'm really poor for equity partners because our threshold is really high okay. um, to, uh, to do something like that. So really it's real on the lending side. Um, if you have money and you say, Hey, Greg, I'd like to work with you. <laughs> that would really make my day. <laughs> but uh, we can talk about partnering a little bit on deals and uh, using my experience and analysis and your money to find something that works for both of us. And it's not just because you have money doesn't mean we'll work together. It's gotta be the right combination of people. Uh, because if you're, if you're not the right match, uh, that ugliness is just not worth it. Makes sense. And it's not just that you're not good enough for me. I might not be good enough for you. It works both ways. Yep. Yep. So how can, uh, if somebody would like to reach out to you, how should they be, uh, how should they reach out to you? Um, mostly it's by email. I try to make sure that my emails are answered every single day. Okay. So that, that is the best way. Do you want to share um, share your email or Certainly. push them to LinkedIn? It's uh, hello at gregsharprealestate.com. All right. Perfect. Well, Greg, thank you very much um, for, for stopping over here and sharing with us your, uh, your experience in real yes. estate. 
I'm sure I can speak with everybody um, listening and watching that we, we really enjoyed it. Um, stay on after the show, but for everybody watching, um, we'll see you next time. Thanks for watching. Thank you.